Our theme for 2021 is redeeming the time. We have talked about these days as being difficult days, and they certainly are challenging. But I don't know if you've thought about this. You know, when we talk about these being hard times, it must sound strange to a generation that has survived several world wars. A great great depression, polio, tuberculosis, not to mention people who have survived the Holocaust. You know, today we go to great lengths to avoid suffering. In fact, we go to great lengths to avoid inconvenience. But a generation ago, and many other places in the world today, people have the expectation that life is hard. And sometimes it's also pleasant. But today, most of us have the expectation that life is supposed to be good. Life is supposed to be pleasant. And that hardship is somehow the exception. Is it wrong to want life to be easy? Let's take a moment to try to get perspective. Remember what we've been saying. God is providence. He created the world. He sustains the world. He is moving everything towards a conclusion. Remember also we said that God is faithful and he wants us to be faithful. But faithfulness can be a challenge when the whole world is in rebellion against God. We've also said last week that God is beyond time and seasons. He knows the end from the beginning. Nothing is going to happen that God has not already seen and does not already know. You know, I was thinking about that this morning as we were doing prophecies and fulfillment. Nothing is going to happen that God has not already seen. Remember also we said that the kingdoms of this world are falling and the kingdom of God is rising. It's easy to believe God when times are good. But how do we find faith in difficult times? First of all, I believe, and I have a deep conviction about this, that suffering is never God's plan. Why do I say that? Because God is good. God is good. But God allows suffering. And he actually uses that pain to accomplish something good. So the goal is not necessarily to avoid suffering. Of course, we avoid it when we can. But it's not necessarily to avoid suffering, but sometimes, or most of the time, many times, we move through it. But we move through it with God. Time and providence will show that God is with you in every situation. Those of you who know my story know that I moved through a very dark time of grief and loss. And I can tell you that God was with me through it. We pick up the story of Daniel again. But this time we're going to focus on Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You recognize those names? Yeah, you know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? First of all, let's talk about the image. Now, last time we heard from Daniel and his friends, God had both revealed and interpreted the king's dream. Now, as a result, they were given prominent assignments in Babylon. Here are four Jewish youths that had been impacted by Israel's revival under King Josiah, and now they are serving in the land of their enemies. They are representing Yahweh, representing the God of Israel, representing the Most High God in a foreign country. 
And that brings me to my first fill in the blank. God trusts us to bear his image. You thought I was going to use the other kind of image, but yeah. The, God trusts us to bear his image. Have you ever thought about this? The Babylonians probably thought that their God had defeated the God of Israel, right? That's what they would have concluded. But Yahweh shows up in Babylon in these stories to demonstrate that he is far from defeated. He is still accomplishing his purpose through his people. They've just taken a bit of a detour. (laughs) Nobody expected that this was going to happen in Babylon. Remember Daniel and his three friends, they were actually Jewish royalty who had been shipped off to Babylon and they are there as diplomatic envoys. Can you say hostages? (laughs) They're there to ensure cooperation between the territories. And they went through their training time, which was actually a kind of reprogramming, brainwashing. But through it, they remained faithful to God, and they were blessed, even in their place of captivity. Now, as a result of Daniel interpreting the king's dream, he is now in the royal palace, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are all regional officials. You might be interested to note There are many ancient documents preserved from this time period. And one scholar has noted that these names actually show up in ancient Babylonian documents. He's made the likely identifications. Hananiah, or Shadrach, was given the title chief of the royal merchants. Imagine that. Azariah, or Abednego, was the secretary to the crown prince. And Mishael, or Meshach, was given the job of overseer of the slave girls. Now, it's been said that the greatest sources of temptation are money, sex, and power. If that's the case, then these three Hebrews were entrusted with some of the most difficult and most delicate jobs in the whole kingdom. Think about it. They were overseeing the women, the commerce, and the heir to the throne. But their integrity is about to be tested again. What happens when faithfulness to Yahweh comes in direct conflict to faithfulness to their assignments? Here's the next fill in the blank. God does miracles, but people turn them into idols. Let's start in Daniel chapter 3, the first two verses. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come and to dedicate the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar is seen here making a statue. And that statue looks somewhat like the one he saw in his dream, except this statue is gold all the way down from top to bottom. Now, we're not told what the statue actually looked like. If it was a statue of the king or of the god of Babylon or maybe it was just a big pillar (laughs) of some sort. However, it seems that it was likely made after the statue that he saw in his vision because that is, after all, the context of this story. What we are told explicitly, however, is the dimensions and the materials. Think about it. 60 cubits, each cubit is about a foot and a half, 90 feet high. That's like nine stories, okay? 90 feet high, 
nine feet wide and finished with solid gold. I don't know if you can imagine this. 90 feet high, solid gold. What happens when the sun comes up and shines after all, off of all of that gold? <laughs> Blinding. <laughs> this thing was like a laser light show. <laughs> I mean, I can just imagine. And that's probably when the music would start playing. You know, dun, 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 you know. As that brightness flashes around you and you're supposed to hit the deck, right? The location, Dura, the word actually means wall or fortification. Archaeologists have uncovered a large brick platform about 16 miles southeast of the ancient city. Perhaps this is where it all happened. But it's interesting to note that even though the statue resembles the dream in some respects, some key details have been changed. In the dream, the statue, the head was gold, but as you went down, it was lesser materials. This one, the entire statue is covered in gold. And remember in the dream, there was this mixture of iron and clay at the bottom that made the statue unstable. Well, here we have a brick foundation providing maximum stability. And the dimensions of this image are somewhat of an engineering marvel. I mean, when you think about it, that tall and that narrow, you would need a very strong framework, perhaps maybe iron or solid stone. Something has to provide the rigidity to go that tall. And that would need to be integrated into the base. So here you have the iron and the clay, the brick, being mixed, but now it's to provide maximum stability instead of compromised stability. In the dream, the statue was made to fall by a large stone striking the base. But now, instead of the statue bowing, everyone else has to bow to the statue. Do you see what's happening here? The story of the king's dream is being revised, retold, and reinterpreted to put the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, at the center instead of the rock, which we know is Jesus. The point of the dream, when Daniel interpreted, was to make the king realize that he is not God. But now they're making an idol out of the statue and worshiping the king as God, exactly the opposite of what God intended to communicate. Do you think that spinning a story, controlling the narrative, or rewriting history are something new? Not at all. It's been happening since ancient Babylon. And they were really good at it, too. They had a whole multimedia presentation designed to really wow their audience, complete with music and a light show. Daniel 3, 4 to 6, let's pick it up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe. Yeah, they had bagpipes, that's cool. And every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Let me give you another fill in the blank. You bear the image of whatever you are impressed with. 
you bear the image of whatever you are impressed with. Now, Bible scholars largely agree that the purpose of this whole exercise was to test the loyalty of the king's subjects. That's why he did this. Do you get the feeling that King Nebuchadnezzar has a bit of a Napoleon complex? He's compensating for his own personal insecurity. We saw that a little bit in how Daniel had to talk to him when he interpreted his dream. He's going to all this trouble to make a good impression. And just in case you are not impressed, well, there's also the threat of death. An idol represents the one who made it. An image represents the one who made it. Notice that God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, does not allow his people to make idols, and he says, you shall have no graven image. Do you know why that is? Because we are made in his image. God, the most high God, can only be represented personally. You know, throughout the empires of the world, coins were stamped with the image of the ruler so that all the trade and the commerce would be under the regulation of the empire. That's why Jesus is famously quoted as saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Let's look at that passage in Matthew 22, verses 16 to 22. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God faithfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him in denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness is on this? Whose inscription? They said, Caesar's. He said, okay, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Now, image is very important because image determines allegiance. Just as a coin bears the mark of its stamp, you bear the image of whatever you are impressed with. Ever thought of that? Our minds, our hearts are impressionable. We can be shaped The choice that we have is to open ourselves to godly influences to be shaped by them. You're made in God's image. So give to God what is God's. Now, I don't know if you have this question. I I certainly did. So so what about Daniel? (laughs) Did did he bow to the image? (laughs) Not likely. Daniel had already proven his loyalty to God. Maybe, just maybe, he was exempt because of palace business, you know. He was, after all, pretty high up in the palace, and this was taking place just outside of town. Maybe he's like, sorry, guys, can't leave the palace. The other three apparently missed it the first time around, too. And they had a special encore performance just for them followed by a barbecue. Let's talk about the furnace. Now, a furnace would have been a key structure during the construction of the image and of its complex. Brick kilns, I've seen these while I was traveling in India. They still look like this, and I included a couple of pictures of of what this might look like. Brick kilns are large beehive-shaped structures with an opening at the top and a hole at the bottom to put fuel in. And obviously you need a lot to let smoke out. Here's a, another picture of ancient kilns. 
The same structure could be used to make bricks for the foundation or it was probably needed to smelt the iron or the gold for the construction of the image. But now this furnace is serving as a deterrent to anyone who would defy the king's command. So our three friends are getting ready for a trial by fire. Speaking of trial by fire, let's look and see where that term comes from. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you might also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So what is a trial by fire? Peter may have been alluding to this story from Daniel. But testing of our faith, suffering, is something that we all experience. After all, Peter reasons, if Jesus suffered, we can expect to suffer too. But we can also expect something glorious to come out of it. So what kind of fiery trials might we experience? And here's your fill in the blank. People. People will betray you. Anybody experience that? Mm Mm-hmm. I see your heads nodding. Let's go to Daniel 3, pick up in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. So there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Have you ever noticed that when God prospers you, somebody's going to be jealous? If it's all about you, you're going to be tempted to get defensive, right? But if your life is about glorifying God, then you're not focused on what other people think because your focus is on God. Do you see what our friends are being accused of? They're not paying enough attention to the king. That's what they're being accused of. These men don't pay enough attention to you, O king. Somebody knew how to play off of the king's personal insecurities. If you want to get me in trouble, just make it illegal to mind my own business, right? Daniel interpreted the king's dream because the king was paranoid. He thought some of his subjects were out to get him. And now the interpretation of that dream is twisted into this bizarre loyalty test where you have to worship the king's image. Does anyone else see the irony of Daniel saving all of their lives just to have them use it against him as a trap for him and his friends? Maybe it isn't just people. Maybe it's diabolical. Maybe there's a spiritual enemy behind all this. And that brings me to the next fill in the blank. Demons will hate you. Demons will hate you. Let's pick up again in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. 
But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow. Look what happens next. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. What just happened here? At the end of the last chapter... Nebuchadnezzar was just praising the God of Daniel. And now he's insane. His face is literally contorting with rage. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it looks like somebody manifesting a demon. I think it's likely the case because hatred is not normal. Hatred recognizes evil and seeks to destroy it. Wanting to destroy another person fails to recognize them as human. The problem is is that so often we hate the person and not the evil. And I don't know if you found this to be true, but I have. People who hate are very often controlled by the very evil that they hate. Ephesians 6.12 says it this way, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, when you run up against that kind of opposition, it's no longer about people. But there's something behind them. There's something operating through them that is driving that hatred. I didn't put this in my notes. I had an experience once when I was fresh out of high school and working in a factory. Here I was, good little Mennonite farm boy, decided to go out into the real world and get a job and I was working with this guy who was a pretty rough character I mean he'd tell me stories about how he had been in and out of jail and all of the people that he had exploited by various means and and um, he was trying to intimidate me and one day he looked at me with this really weird look on his face and he said I don't know why I don't just kill you And in that moment, the Spirit of God just came over me and I smiled at him real big and I said, I know why. King Nebuchadnezzar was punishing the wrong men. Hananiah, Shadrach, Mikael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego were among his most loyal subjects but they would not feed into his selfish pride. Some of their colleagues saw this, and they fanned the flames of the king's ego and then directed it against the Jews. All of this is part of a diabolical plan to use the vanity of man to defeat the will of God. But can God's will ever be defeated. You know, God may not always stop a bad thing from happening, but one thing you can be sure of, and this is the next fill in the blank, but God will be with you. God will be with you. Let's keep reading. In verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. 
he declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now I know it's really gross, but the king was actually watching all of this to see what would happen. You know, that hole in the bottom where you put the fuel in, they apparently jammed that packed with wood, but as it burned down, he's there peering in, looking to see what would happen. From the language, it appears it says that they were thrown down into the fire, so apparently they were hoisted up onto the top of this thing. Now, some of these kilns were actually built with flat roofs, and some of them were actually built into the side of a hillside. However it is, they got them in the top, some of these mighty men were actually killed in that process because it's hot up there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in fully clothed. Clothing, by the way, is flammable. So you would think that by the time the king was able to peer into that furnace, there would be nothing left. They're no longer bound. They're walking around. And there are four of them. Who's the fourth man? Now it says he's like a son of the gods. Now that's just another way of saying he appears to be divine. You know, there are numerous appearances in the Old Testament of the angel of the Lord, which we talked about when we studied the unseen realm. The angel of the Lord is a manifestation of God himself. Jesus is said to have appeared pre-incarnate as the angel of the Lord. Now, how does that work? How does Jesus appear in the Old Testament before he is born in the New Testament? Well, for all you sci-fi fans out there, we know how this works. That's just time travel right? God is outside of time and space. He can do this stuff. And God is able to deliver from suffering. But sometimes he doesn't. I don't know why God allowed these three men to be thrown into the fire. I'm sure it was not pleasant for any of them, except maybe for a very demented king. But God was in there with them. Imagine how it must have been. There had not yet been an incarnation. They didn't know about Jesus suffering and dying for our sin. This was before those chapters were written. All they knew was that they are in covenant with God and that God is faithful. And God shows up. But notice, he doesn't show up until they are in the fire. And God is in the fire with them. So let's talk about the proclamation. Nebuchadnezzar saw all of this, and it led him to make several proclamations. He had already proclaimed that if anyone did not bow to the image, they would be thrown into the fire. And the furnace was supposed to be the end of the story. Nobody stopped to think about what happens after the furnace. And from here on in the chapter, you don't hear another word about that image. It doesn't matter. The king made a test for loyalty, and he failed his own test. Let's pick up in Daniel 3, verse 26. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, and their cloaks, their clothing, was not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Here's the first proclamation in your fill in the blank. Come out and come here. Come out and come here. So you're in the fire and God shows up and now a voice comes from outside saying, come out and come here. That must be the way Lazarus felt (laughs) when Jesus called him out of the grave. (laughs) Come out and come here. Except if I'm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know what I'd be thinking? I'd be thinking, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. I'm safer in here. The guy who threw me in there is out there. Sometimes it's easier to be in the fire with God than to face the people and circumstances that led you to the fire. I didn't think I was going to be preaching on forgiveness this morning, but do you think these three guys had some forgiving to do? Walking out of the fire may take as much faith as going in. They were thrown into the fire bound, but they have to walk out under their own power. Are you ready to walk out of the fire? We're so afraid of suffering. But you know, sometimes when you're in it, it begins to feel normal. Some people have suffered for so long that they don't know anything else. So are you ready to walk out of the fire? Just remember, God is with you. Here's the next declaration. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Picking up in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command, uh, says the king. And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. Remember how I said that you are made in God's image and you're made to glorify him. You know, Nebuchadnezzar got to see what true faithfulness looks like. You realize that most of his servants are serving him either to get what they want or because they're scared of him. But these three men are loyal to their God out of love with no clear benefit. They trust God without knowing what's in it for them. Do you know what it means to serve a purpose greater than yourself? Have you found anything in life worth losing your life for? Faith in God is far greater than this life. You know, if I lose this life serving God, then I have something far better waiting for me. Let's pick up with Jesus' words in Mark chapter 8, 34 to 38. And calling the crowd to himself with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? But whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father and with the holy angels. You know, no one is asking you to die for your faith right now. But you know how you prepare? You begin by dying to yourself. You start to deal with that pride, the anger, or anything else that does not resemble God's image in you. Here's another proclamation, and one that you can make too. Look what God has done for me. Look what God has done for me. And here we're going to wander into Daniel chapter 4 a little bit. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. You know, when you pass the test, you have a testimony. You would think that it was Nebuchadnezzar that was delivered out of the fire by the way he talks. But you know, that fire was a sign to him. He was deceived. He was in pride. He was in direct opposition to the word that was given to him by Daniel interpreting his dream. Nebuchadnezzar was in rebellion against God. But what did he do? He confessed. God, you're right, I'm wrong. My rule is temporary, but yours is eternal. I win only because you already won. If giving God glory seems like a strange thing to you, then you still have a lot to learn. You are made in his image. You will never be all that God has meant you to be apart from him. Serving God with your life means living your life with God not just for God. I don't know what lies ahead. I'm sure there will be good times and there will be bad times. We may go through a season of suffering. I'm kind of expecting it. But I also know that God is with us. So here's some questions for reflection. First of all, do you have a situation in your life right now where you are being tested? How does your response in this situation reflect God to those around you? What do you need to realize to be able to give the right impression? And that word impression is a pun. Number two, is there some suffering that you are afraid may come? Do you know that God is able to deliver you? He is. But if God doesn't deliver you from it, are you convinced? that he will deliver you through it. Number three, what fiery trial are you going through? How is God with you right now? 
What is God working in you right now to help you to emerge from this trial differently than how you went in? And if you're in a fiery trial right now, all I can say is, praise God, you are still standing. Praise God, you're still standing. Let's stand and worship the Lord together.